Let's have a look at the second assumption we make in order to do a linear regression analysis. The second assumption was that there should be no autocorrelation in the error term. That means your errors ought to be scattered randomly around your regression line. So it should look like uh, this. So you got your regression line and your errors ought to be scattered randomly around your regression line. Okay, so it should look like this. So this is perfect. There's no relationship between the errors whatsoever. This is how it should look like. But if there's a systematic relationship among the errors, we speak of autocorrelation within the error term. So um, it might look like this. So you got your regression line and your errors are scattered in a systematic relationship along your regression line. So it could look like this or it could look like this. Okay, um, first of all, we need to talk a little about our actual experiment. Um, in statistics, we distinguish between cross-sectional and time series data. So we distinguish between cross-sectional and time series data. So cross-sectional and time series data. Um, cross-sectional data could be a study where we do research on the population of a, a given city in a fixed point of time, for example. So we might be interested in knowing why people died in London in 1864. Um, our observations would be a random sample of London citizens recorded at a fixed date. Time series um, uh, data, on the other hand, um, was collected observing the same object over consecutive time uh, points. Read prices in Paris from 1840 to 1890, for example, that would be time series data. Uh, we observed the price of read in Paris um, over many years. Um, if you're using time series data, your observations are most likely not independent. There are, are, are causes in the past that influence the behavior of people in the future. So if you regress a dependent variable um, y and you're using um, an independent variable x, so you try to explain y with an independent variable x, so y and x over here. Um, and if you do that, it could happen that your errors are not scattered randomly around your regression line. So again, it could end up like this. So um, this is what we call runs. Um, they stay, so our errors, they stay either above the line, stay there for a while, then go beneath the line and stay there for a while, go above the line again and so on. Um, there is definitely a relationship underlying our errors. So these are runs. So this is a run, this is a run as well and so on, okay? Um, this is not random, there's autocorrelation in our errors and you can use past errors to predict future errors in your regression. So for example, you can go ahead and say, okay, the errors at point uh, or the error at time t is equal to the error at time t minus one and of course some um, random error. Now, um, Again, this is something that is common in time series data. In most cross-sectional cross -sectional analyses, there will be no autocorrelation because after all, the observations were picked randomly. But even in cross-sectional data, there is room for autocorrelated errors since there could be measurement error. Um, now, what is the consequence of autocorrelated errors? Well, the bad thing about autocorrelated errors is that they produce wrong standard errors. But the great thing about correlation is that it is so easy to detect. We could take a look at our plot again. So let's do that. We can take a look at our plot over here and uh, see whether we see some indicators for autocorrelated errors. Well, in this example, it's pretty obvious, but the correlation might not always be that obvious. So we need a hypothesis to test for autocorrelated errors. And to do this, we'll use the Durbin-Watson test. And I'll write that down for you. So in order to test this, we'll use the Durbin, Durbin Watson, Durbin Watson test. Okay. And the Durbin Watson test gives us back two very important measures. Well, the first measure is a D statistic. And if there is no autocorrelation at all, 
this will be close to 2.0. So if D is close to 2.0, we can say, okay, there is no autoregressive process underlying our errors. But if D is not close to 2.0, then we have evidence that there is an AR process underlying our errors. Um, since D might not always be equal to 2.0 due to pure chance, we also need a p-value that lets us decide whether to reject or accept the hypothesis that there are autocorrelated errors. So it also gives you a p-value. Um, if you have to reject the hypothesis of no autocorrelation uh, in your errors, doing our normal regression analysis wouldn't be such a good idea since it produced ro produces wrong uh, standard errors. So if you have evidence for um, um, autocorrelated errors, uh, do not do our normal regression analysis. However, the Durbin-Watson test oh, is only testing whether there is first order autocorrelation in our error term. So it only checks whether we have first order correlation in our error term. Well, it could happen that there is an autocorrelation of higher order in our data. So we, so we should also check for higher order autocorrelation in our error term. And, in, and uh, to do this, we'll use, and I'll write that down as well, we'll use the so-called Broich, Broich Godfrey test. So the Broich Godfrey test. Um, and just like the Durham Watson test, it gives us back a p value. Um, so we can decide whether to reject the null hypothesis of no autocorrelation or not. Now, if you detect that there is autocorrelation within your error, you must account for this, or otherwise your standard errors will be wrong and you'll draw wrong conclusions. And luckily, there are, uh, there are ways to correct our standard errors when autocorrelation or autocorrelated errors are present. But correcting for violated assumptions will be the, will be the topic of future videos.